Hey everybody, uh, welcome to another episode of uh, Radio KBE. Uh, thanks for joining me. Um, on this episode, I wanted to talk about uh, Westbrook's contract, Russell Westbrook's contract, and just sort of the conversation that's been going on uh, around it, especially on Twitter, and then like what you've been reading from like national writers and uh, folks at ESPN and stuff like that. And um, essentially, what I wanted to sort of get at was, you know to talk about how the way that his play is being juxtaposed with his position, uh, with his contract value and how, you know, sort of mainstream media is going out of their way. We're not mainstream media because that sounds very political, but like national media is sort of going out of its way to make it sound like it's this albatross contract that's like untradeable and nobody wants him um, and stuff like that. So before I go into it in detail, I uh, appreciate all the folks that have been watching so far. Um, if you haven't already, if you can like and subscribe, that'll help the channel out a lot, and, and I appreciate you significantly. Um, so let's get into it. Um, Russ is going to make forty-four million. Um, he's making forty-four million. When the league turns over into the next season officially, he'll be making forty-seven million in his player option. So right now he's still locked into that forty-four million dollar number. Um, a lot of the conversation, you know, obviously Russ hasn't had a great season uh, for the Lakers. The Lakers had a terrible season for a ton of reasons. And um, whether Russ played well or not, uh, he was always going to be sort of, you know, when you make that much money, you're going to be the guy that gets looked at as, you know, just the terrible player. Um, it's a phenomenon that happens with all NBA fans for some reason. And I think it's because national media is conditioned f fan bases and NBA fans to blame one person um, and not, this is not to say that Russ, you know, Russ had his flaws. He, he's had some issues. Um, he has declining athleticism. He was missing dunks, missing layups. So it's, it's not what it is. This is more talking about like the, the, the value of the player and the contract and what the expectation is of him. But, um, Russ signed this super max contract after he won the MVP in OKC. So he's basically reaching the last part of his year. Same thing you see with John Wall, um, Chris Paul opted out of his 44 million, the last year of his 44 million um, player option with with the Suns and then extended for 370 of guaranteed. Um, this is a common thing. You know, it's not uncommon for a player to sign a super max and then five years from that point onwards, there's some version of them that's declined, especially when it's like after their second contract or third contract. Uh, but the way that national media is talking about Russ's contract and what the Lakers have to do to get off of it is... Um, I'm not saying it's untrue. I think it, it leans way too far in the direction of making it seem like the Lakers are going to be a very desperate team and that uh, they'll have like, you know, they're going to be at the mercy of like whoever they're negotiating with and they have to give up two first round picks um, and maybe then some. And then you get folks who go over the top and say, well, they'll have to attach picks and then they'll have to attach players like, I don't think any of that is grounded in reality. Um, whatever you think of Russ as a player or whatever you think of Russ as a person, um, he is an able-bodied player. Like, he finished the season, like, 18, 7, and 7 or so, some number like that. And, um, you know, like I said, like, the production, it may not look pretty, but the production and the role is somewhat there to some degree. Does it justify $47 million? Uh, you know, obviously not. Um, but if Russ was making 15 to $20 million and putting up those numbers, I'm pretty sure people wouldn't be complaining that the way that they are. So clearly it's, it's, it's the contract value is, is one of the things, and obviously basketball fit is, is also an issue, but this idea that Russ is a, like an almost useless player and that there's 29 teams in the NBA that wouldn't want him. Um, and that like, it's basically he's either playing for the Lakers or he's out the league. Like, I don't think there's any two, two things that could be more of an extreme from each other, especially when you have actual examples of players who are literally out. Teams would rather pay them to not show up. Um, a guy like John Wall is an example of that. Not, nothing against John Wall. Same thing. He signed that contract a long time ago, had an Achilles tear. He's just, he hasn't been able to stay healthy. Like Houston is very content with him staying at home like they would rather him not show up at all they don't see any value 
in him coming and, and playing for the Rockets. Even if it meant in a lost season that John Wall comes back and maybe plays up some value so that you could trade him for a guy like Russell Westbrook. Because if you guys remember, there was rumors about the Lakers trading Russ for John Wall and that that would make the Lakers better. And we had not seen John Wall in like two years or a year and a half. And your pe- people were going off of Instagram videos thinking to themselves, oh, you know, he's back. Like he can be much better than Russ. Only for Anthony Davis to go down um, after the All-Star break and sprain his ankle. And then LeBron gets shut down because he sprained his ankles. And then at that point, you would have traded a first rounder for John Wall. Like, that's the point that I'm trying to make. Like, what you read online and what you read, especially on NBA Twitter, it's not grounded in reality. Like, if you think about it in hindsight, if the Lakers had been so desperate to trade Russ and a first for John Wall, only to have LeBron and AD go down again, you would have sort of looked like fools. And this is assuming John Wall is still able-bodied and and stuff like that. And so I think what the reason I'm bringing that up, um, not to attack Wall or or to to justify Russ, but it's just I think that's still happening. Um, I think a lot of folks in the media are, because they personally dislike the player, they assume his value is incredibly low. And if there's anything that... I think real Laker fans or just Laker fans in general have seen that's been a consistent theme of this team and players on this team for the past, I don't know. I mean, I've only been on Twitter for three years, but since I've been on Twitter for three years, every Laker role player gets downplayed by people outside the fan base. Everybody gets told that those players have no value whatsoever. And yet somehow the Lakers are consistently finding ways to, you know, aggregate for a better player like. Danny Green in a first for Dennis Schroeder in the moment was looked at as a, as a great move for the Lakers. Uh, for whatever reason, Dennis Schroeder wasn't retained. Um, I don't know if it was because of the contract value he was asking for. Some part of it of me suspects it had to do something with you know his vaccination status um, and him not wanting to be uh, vaccinated or, or not not um, um, not being interested in being vaccinated and then that being sort of a hard line rule for, for uh, the Lakers roster this season. That may change now, moving forward next year. Uh, so who knows what will happen um, with that sort of status. It obviously had to do with local jurisdictions and, and then the laws and stuff like that that the Lakers had. Um, but this consistent theme of downplaying the players and the value of those players um, has been pretty consistent. Like it's, It doesn't matter how good the player plays. He's always going to be downplayed. There was a point in the season, the season we won the championship, um, where people are saying that Kyle Kuzma wasn't worth like even a second, like at the most, the most value you could get for Kyle Kuzma was a second rounder. And then it's just, again, same thing with KCP, um, same thing with Alex Caruso. He was looked at as a meme, and then now people go to another, another team and then gets looked at as, as like a, um, you know, like, like an all defensive caliber, near all defensive caliber guard. Um, impactful beyond the actual box score and stuff like that. And so that theme is always going to be consistent. Uh, and, and I don't want to say it's limited. It's not limited to just um, not national media. Like our local media does the same exact thing. Like the folks that work our local, our local media are incentivized to um, get the most extreme reaction. The one that, that's the most, whether it's a good reaction or a negative reaction, the most reaction is the most important. The most engagement is the most important part. So, the stuff that you keep hearing about the player not being untradeable—that's happening because they want the most negative reaction. They want fear mongering. They need extreme reactions from the fan base. And um, I'm glad that the Lakers didn't make that trade at the deadline for John Wall because it just—it made no sense. We had never seen. We we had no idea what was going to play. But I think moving forward now into this offseason, you're hearing the same stuff. Russ is unmovable, untradeable. And then, you know, out the blue, Mark Stein mentions that uh, Charlotte may be interested in trading for Russ because for whatever reasons, leaderships, locker room, ball, like Russ has a tenure of, or he has a historical record of going into locker rooms and all of his teammates speak very highly of him. <clears throat> this is a first season. And I don't even know if it was a vocal thing. Like, there's a first season where I've heard people be combative about Russ, but 
um, the combative part was felt like it was more fans versus Russ than it was anybody in the locker room versus what Russ. Basketball fit aside, all that sort of stuff. But like that kind of stuff has values value to GMs. But circling back, Russ's contract is an expiring contract, uh, assuming they don't trade him before the league turns over. Um, Forty-seven million dollars. If if we assume that he opts in and and you know they they figured out they they they're going to trade him. Russ's contract is probably one of the most valuable contracts in the NBA because of the nature of it expiring. And I think that's something that, I don't know why, but it's something that it, it seems like it's being deliberately ignored um, considering historical record. Expiring contracts have always been valuable in the NBA, always. Uh, the bigger, the better. Because you don't have to take on a whole bunch of players uh, and, and cut specific roster spots. You just have to take on one player and send out a bunch of players that you may not want or, or and what it may be. And um, I'm not going to get into the specific teams right now, but I just want to sort of talk about um, the types of teams you're looking at. Um, obviously, the first team that you think of when it comes to Russ is, is a team that's looking to rebuild. Uh, somebody that said, you know what, we peaked as a team. We need to tear this all down, start over, trade everybody, gather as many picks, um, uh, Oklahoma City style or Houston style trade all the picks that we can, and then uh, with a full teardown, you know, uh, find, the, find the next guy, find find the next Zion Williamson, or find whoever the next leader of that team is going to be. Uh, some teams do that, still do that. OKC's been doing that, just flipping first-rounders until they find the guy that they want. Um, and then some teams do it in a different way, right? Like you have a team um, that's not necessarily doing a full teardown. You have a team that's doing sort of a retool of what they're doing, like the, the Portland Trailblazers. So there's two types of teams that would probably be interested in Russ's contract. Not probably, like guaranteed to be interested in Russ's contract. A, a, a team that's looking to do a full teardown um, is, is a team that may be interested in Russ's contract. And then a team that's looking to retool, which means it's a team that has too many um, role players that it committed to maybe a year or two ago, and they've realized now um, you know, two seasons in, three seasons in, that, you know what, we've hit the peak with these role players. Like, we can't go any further. We have to try either a different methodology, like a different coaching philosophy, or we have to, um, you know, just something needs to change. So teams, like, uh, I'll give you two teams that I would consider uh, uh, teams that would be retooling. I mentioned the Blazers earlier with them trading CJ and all these other guys. Um, two teams that come to mind are, are a team like the Utah Jazz, and then another team is a team like the Atlanta Hawks. Like those are two teams who have probably peaked in terms of what they can do with their current personnel. Um, and in the case of Atlanta, they sort of have a, they have a talent log jam. They have too many guys who play the same position who can't get equal shares of minutes. And then they have guys that who are looking for their first big contract that can't get those minutes because there's too many other guys that are already getting paid that much money. So you could see how like having too much talent, having ownership that may be a little constricted in spending, having, you know, trying to figure out offensive philosophy, that stuff all can can lead to different situations, things that you don't expect. I'm not saying either one of those teams are, are interested in making a trade, but in Utah's case, they may be a team that's looking to get younger. Um, they have guys like Mike Conley, uh, Bogdanovich, um, Royce O'Neal's young, but like you know, a lot. There's been a lot of talk about moving Rudy Gobert, uh, and, and moving you know, or, and, and keeping Donovan. And then you hear stories about them keeping Donovan and Rudy Gobert, and maybe moving role players around. That's another team that's an excellent example of a team that just may look to retool. They may not do a full teardown. Um, that may not be the direction that they want to go in. Uh, and so, the reason why I bring that up is because for teams like that who are looking to retool or do full rebuilds, Russ is a great, Russ's contract is, is great for that specific purpose. And I think one of the things, the lesser things that, that gets talked about um, is the fact that, you know, and it's, some of it's because just people don't know about it in the CBA, but the Lakers are a tax paying team, which means that any salary that they send out, they can bring back up to that amount plus 25% of that money. Um, and I know the Lakers, Laker fans have issues with whether we're going to spend a lot, when we're not going to spend a lot, that sort of thing. And obviously the, the, the big looming thing is how long LeBron James is going to be uh, staying with the Lakers. And that contract 
um, that contract conversation is, is probably going to be the most important thing outside of who the Lakers decide uh, who they're going to have as a coach. But let me put it, uh, I'll put it in the most plain, simplest way that I think helps folks understand how valuable Russ's contract is. Because, of the, because they can take on 25%, because they're a taxpayer, um, because they can take on 25% more than what they send out, sending Russ out before the season turns over means that the Lakers can bring back somewhere around like $55 million in salary. So they just send out $44 million. And I'll give you the exact number right now, actually, so I have the calculator open. They can get bring back. They they send out Russ by himself. They can take on up to fifty five million dollar in contract fifty five million dollars in contracts from another team, and it doesn't have to be a single trade. Russ can go to a third team like OKC, who has cap space that may absorb him. They can go and add a guy like Derek Favors. They can add Mike Muscala, and Eric Pincus has been really uh, good about this. Um, senior writer for Bleacher Report, highly recommended follow. He's cap guru, super expert when it comes to it. But they can bring. They can send Russ over there, take on two guys in there, and then still possibly talk to a third team, whether it's through a traded player exception or whether they want to get them involved in a three-way deal where they just absorb whatever contracts that the third team doesn't want. So if you think about it, let's take a team like Utah, for example, that really wants to get off of Mike Conley's contract and really wants to get off of, or sorry, not Utah, because they may not trade within the conference. Let's think about a team like the Hawks. Um, Let's say that the Hawks, really want to move certain guys. They want to move Gallinari. They want to move um, maybe Bogdanovich because they have Trey Herter there. Again, this is just spec. I don't know any if any of this stuff happened. The Lakers can go to OKC and say, hey, we'll give you Russ because um, you have $35 million. We'll take Derek Favors. We'll take, my, we'll take whatever bad contracts you don't want. And they can go to Atlanta and say, look, you don't want Gallo? We'll take him. You don't want Clint Capella? We'll take him too because... Uh, you guys have Onyeka, uh, and and you know he he needs his minutes, and DeAndre Hunter needs his minutes. So we'll we'll take Capella, and we'll take Gallinari, and, and and we'll take Bogdanovich if you don't want him, or you know just whatever role players you don't want. The only thing the Lakers, uh, the Lakers, you know the thing that the Lakers can do is they could turn around and that third team they can go to that third team and say, look, we'll take these long term salaries off of your books for these role players that you guys don't want. All we we need is for you to send a first round pick to Oklahoma City. And if Oklahoma City only wants a first rounder or like a first and a second, then maybe the Lakers don't have to send it to them. Maybe the Lakers only have to send a second. And maybe the value of, of um, you know, getting $55 million off your books for a team like uh, Atlanta is a big deal. Because maybe Atlanta is a team that wants to send a max offer sheet to a guy like DeAndre Eaton. So there's so many different things that can possibly happen. That's just one example of, of something that can happen where the Lakers don't can use their cap space and use Russ's contract in a way where they can leverage that situation. It's just having the right conversations and, and our front office doing their due diligence. It doesn't have to be Atlanta. It could be New York. It could be Indiana. It could be Charlotte. A lot of different teams that are in those situations where they have too many guys that they're going to have to extend or they may want to change priority. Charlotte may be interested in, in going after a guy like DeAndre Ayton. Atlanta may be interested going after him. The Knicks may be interested. But all these teams need to have cap space in order to, to send offer sheets to those players um, or to sign guys that they want, like Jalen Brunson, who's had an outstanding playoff series uh, in the playoffs this year and heavily rumored to, to go to New York uh, or to go to Detroit, where his father has ties. Like Some teams have cap space, some teams don't. And, and that's the part that, that's important. The Lakers keeping themselves involved as a facilitator with their main goal being to bring back the depth that they need to be successful. Um, Russ's contract allows you to do that. And even if you do the math, $55 million is close to about 45% to 50% of the entire salary cap. So even if you don't trade Russ before the season turns over, next season, the Lakers can bring back like close to $60 million. And the cap is like, what, 121, 123? Uh, You're talking about a single contract wiping half of your books 
And that doesn't include any long-term salary that you're shedding in that process, right? Guys that who aren't on expirings themselves, they may be on one or two year or three years, you know, they, they may still have one or two or three years remaining. So the value of having a $47 million contract that allows the other team, whether it's in a one-to-one -one trade or a three-way trade, um, that can wipe up to 60% of your book, or sorry, 50% of your books, I don't know why people think that's not valuable. I don't know why people think that you have to attach a first round to get rid of them. Remember, any team that does that, they can always wave and stretch Russ also. Like, everybody's talked about, oh, Russ has been so bad. Laker fans have said that, you know, we should just get rid of him. It'd be better just to send him home. Obviously, that I think that's a little extreme. But another team could do that. Another team that's looking to retool or rebuild that's okay with eating you know, a, a 13 or $14 million cap hit for three years. Like there's a lot of different directions teams can go in um, that, that teams can, where, where teams can do stuff. But this idea that like, it's just one way, this idea where it's just like, oh, you have to give us two first rounders. I, I think it's just posturing. Um, I, I think it's, I think it's riders not being objective not being fair, not, not, and it, look, it's, it's Lakers. Like, so a negative reaction from Lakers Twitter is going to get you a lot of retweets. It's going to get you, uh, you know, a lot of fans out there that don't like the Lakers, they're going to retweet it because they love to share doom and gloom about other franchises. But I think, I mean, just looking at it objectively, I don't think Russ's value is down the way people are describing. Like he's got 13 years of, good basketball, like uh, not scoring wise, but just being a floor leader, being a locker room leader and stuff like that. And I don't think that just goes away off, off of one season. And I don't think that's a realistic way of looking at it. Um, no matter how you feel about how his season went. And frankly, I don't think an expiring contract that can wipe up to 50% of your, your salary cap books is a reasonable way to think about it either. Like to think that that has no value whatsoever. And <clears throat> in an NBA, um, in an NBA era where a team like the Warriors can miss um, the playoffs two years in a row and immediately have be, you know, within a game or two away from being back in the NBA finals, you can see how quickly things can turn around. And I think other GMs and other owners and, and other smart folks in front offices, they recognize that if you make the right moves, you can strike lightning in a bottle to some degree. And you saw that with the Bucks. Um, you saw that with the Lakers quickly retooling, uh, you know, after missing out on the Kawhi sweepstakes and stuff like that. And it, it, it's not reasonable, I don't think. I don't think it's reasonable at all to think that um, Russ's contract is what it is. So, um, you know, I, I, don't, I don't know what direction the Lakers are going to go in with his contract. Um, you know, obviously he, he hasn't decided whether he's going to opt in or not. Uh, and, you know, the Lakers can't trade him until he decides what he wants to do with his contract. Uh, unless unless they trade him, or I, they probably have to wait for his, him to opt in. But like this idea, and then you're going to hear this a lot uh, up until he gets moved or he doesn't get moved. Like this idea that um, he's a distressed asset, which is the more just the more hipster term that people are using. Uh, I don't think Russ is a distressed asset. Uh, I don't think teams around the league look at him like that. And I think. National media has done a very successful job convincing this fan base, the Laker fan base, that Russ is <laughs> one of the worst things to ever happen uh, to the Lakers ever. And I, I, I just, I, 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 like I said, aside from the personality, aside from the basketball fit, there were so many things that went wrong with the Lakers this season uh, that it, it just... I can't imagine that a $47 million expiring contract um, can be non-valuable. Like, if you said that about John Wall, like, I would understand that. Because you, he, he's not, like, he's not, a, there's no bargaining position because he hasn't played basketball, right? So let's, there's no, there's no, he, his value is purely contract value. Like, he, because nobody's seen him play basketball. With Russ, you've seen him play basketball. You know where what, st what style of basketball he can play in what Sally can't and how to use them and that sort of stuff. So there's some basketball value there. 
Uh, and then obviously his contract value is, is where most of his value lies. Um, and, it, you know, like I said, I, I just don't see it. Um, I, I definitely don't agree with it. Uh, I don't try to give it attention either. Uh, and, you know, Laker fans can do whatever they want. Um, it's totally fine. But I would just push back on that. That that's I think that's the truth of the situation, that, that the Lakers have a golden opportunity uh, to turn this situation around, uh, especially once they figure out what, what happens with Bron's extension uh, and, and who we get as a coach. And it'll be extremely important for our front office to figure that out and, and to push the right buttons uh, to, to make that possible uh, in order for us to win another championship during LeBron's tenure here with the Lakers. But like I said, the, the stuff that's going around about Russ's contract, uh, the fear mongering and all that sort of stuff, like it, it almost seems like it's they're trying to encourage, they're hoping that somebody in the front office is going to read it and just um, make a panic trade or like be down on the value of their own player uh, or the value of that own contract. And I, I, I just don't agree with that. Um, there's a lot of historical evidence that, that that's not true. Um, and there have been worse contracts traded for not much. The Boston Celtics traded Kemba Walker. They traded Al Horford to OKC. They signed Kemba Walker, who is a shell of himself as a player, then traded Kemba Walker to OKC to get Al Horford back in there in the Eastern Conference Finals. So, like, and Kemba Walker got bought out. Like, he still had, like, $79 million dollars. On his on his on uh, on his contract before OKC bought him out, so it's just like again, this idea that the contract is untradeable or that you have to give up tons of picks to make it happen, like I, I just don't agree with that. Um, and and I would encourage Laker fans to not allow people to convince them that uh, either. And um, yeah, that's that's really that's really all I had to say uh, about that. And and hopefully, kind of talking about the cap stuff and how much. He can alleviate and turn around another franchise, depending on whether they want to rebuild or retool. Hopefully that gives some perspective. Um, I'll eventually talk about some of these different teams. But just, you know, the front office has to get this right. They have to make the right decisions, um, whichever direction they decide to go in. And, um, you know, just this is just one of those things where I'm a little bit more optimistic when it comes to it. So uh, I appreciate you folks um, joining me for this discussion. Uh, you know, hopefully we'll get some more news about our coach and stuff like that. Uh, once again, if you can like and subscribe, uh, that'll help the channel a lot. Uh, and I appreciate all the folks who subscribed so far. I did not, I really did not expect um, this much um, sort of traction so far. So I hope you guys enjoy. Uh, and uh, if nothing else, I'll see you guys uh, on Twitter on the timeline or I'll see you in the next video. Thanks.